Hello, everyone. I am so excited. We have with us today Representative Jen Daly Provo. She is the Utah House Representative for District 24. Uh, she is an amazing human being, and you don't want to miss this episode of Plug Into Devin. Hey, Devin. It's great Hello. To be Welcome to the show. Thank you for the kind introduction. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you so much for making time for this. What would you like to talk about? Well, the issue that is really hurting people and affecting people right now is the coronavirus pandemic. Um, as you've probably seen in the news quite a bit lately, there is a lot of activity from state leaders, government leaders, business leaders in trying to address a lot of the catastrophes that are arising out of it, both from a public health perspective and from an economic perspective. And something that is increasingly coming to light is this tricky balance between being nimble and responsive, but still being accountable to taxpayers, to the voters in our state, and, um, and maintaining transparency in some of the activities that are going on. Um, while we don't want to spend a ton of time questioning the, the motives of people, although I believe that that's worth having a conversation about going forward, um, right now, while we're still in the midst of these critical response times, we need to make sure that that information is available, that nobody is unduly taking advantage of this crisis in order to, you know, to enrich themselves, that, that the money that the state is spending is well spent on tools that are going to be effective in saving lives and, you know, in ensuring that we have a as quick of an economic recovery as we possibly can. Yeah, the, it's uh, frustrating that uh, the, the scandal around uh, Test Utah, mm -hmm. uh, it really calls into question the whole program and one wonders if it uh, is or could be helpful, but with the scandal, it seems like it, it can't be because so many people reject it. And so whether it was a good idea or not, it seems like, it failed because of the malfeasance around it. Well, and that's, and that's really, really what we need to get at. And if we don't have any information, you know, if, if there weren't bad intentions, then there's no reason why that information, all of it behind the, the creation of it shouldn't come quickly to light and we can have a conversation about how these decisions were made. But these testing sites cost the state $600,000 per month per site. And we know that the testing rates are for positives are significantly lower than every other site that we have. Now, as a public health professional, as you know, as a matter of background, I think I have a pretty unique perspective. In addition to being a legislator, I have an MBA and I've been the CEO of businesses. Um, and I, but I'm also a PhD student in public health. And so I, you know, I, and I kind of live in this place where these, these worlds intersect. Um, I've long held that my concern about the way we're addressing this pandemic is that we're trying to solve a public health crisis with a business plan. And, you know, being in both of those worlds, um, I think it's an important conversation, but are, there needs to be more of a public health focus going back to the testing. If, positive rates are lower for these sites, there's a way to get at why that is. Perhaps they are testing more people who are asymptomatic, who really are negative, or maybe their false negatives are significantly higher, but we have not been able to get an answer to that. And there are statistical, scientific methods to, to get some answers as, as you know, with regard to that. And if, if, that, if, the neg if the false negatives are the same as any other site, then maybe what they're doing is meaningful and we can keep doing it. But absent that information, we, we just don't have any, we don't have good assurance that state dollars are being spent the right way. And when we're talking about massive people on unemployment, people losing their homes, losing their businesses. We have to watch every dollar very, very carefully. 
as you think about how we effectively begin to reopen the gov- or the, the, the state to mm-hmm. business, how do you, as a, a, a public health professional, think about implementing protections that keep us safe even as we begin to go about doing business again? That's such a good question. Um, I know that that people really need to get back to work. We have seen, particularly with our minority communities, that essential health workers are being hit extremely hard with the infection rate. And the problems really are going to cascade. You know, we're talking about um, a a demographic that tends to have um, lower rates of insurance, which puts them at higher risk of hospitalization, lack of access to um, to care for their symptoms, um, much higher risk of medical bankruptcy. Um, our most vulnerable populations are always the least resilient to disasters. That's what makes them you know, define, that's what creates the definition of a vulnerable population. Um, But as far as reopening the economy, I'm really still very distressed that in the special session, the legislature passed a bill that grants broad um, immunity to businesses who don't take extraordinary actions to protect their employees and their customers. Now, we know that the vast majority of businesses in Utah will go to every length possible to protect their employees and their customers. But we know that there are some out there that won't, and there's no way for us to determine which is which. Um, And then, you know, you see with people who are opposed to the restrictions to things like wearing masks, this really strikes at some cultural issues that we've we've simply got to overcome. Um, the idea of this idea of taking on personal risk to exposure versus risking other people's health and well-being by exposure is is a cultural issue that no policy or law can really address. Um, and so it's it's just so complicated, but. I just think, you know, one of the linchpins in this is being able to hold businesses accountable if they don't take measures to protect their employees and and their customers. And whether that's a a legal liability or um, just calling out bad actors publicly um, so that customers know which businesses are protecting them and and which aren't may, you know, might be our, our most effective tool right now. Well, that's a great, great suggestion. Well, we're out of time, Jen, but what, uh, quickly, what is your superpower? Uh, my superpower is finding common ground with anybody. doesn't matter where you are on the political spectrum. I promise you I can find something that we agree on and can collaborate on. Fantastic. Before you go, tell us how we can learn more about your campaign and connect with you personally. So my website is jenforutah.com. It's J-E-N-F-O-R-Utah.com. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at jenforutah on all three. And my contact information is on my website. I really look forward to the, the coming months, particularly supporting other candidates like yourself. I am lucky this year I don't have a primary or general challenger. And so I'm just anxious to make sure that we elect a legislature that's more responsive to voters. Fantastic. Uh, Again, Jen, thank you so much for being with us and we wish you every success in your efforts to help Utah reopen for business safely. And good luck to you as well, Devin. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Let's be bold together. Let's be bold together. I'm Devin Thorpe. For the last eight years, I've been working full-time to eradicate extreme poverty, improve global health, and fight climate change. I've concluded that the best way for me to continue my work is to run for Congress to represent the people of Utah's third district. In Utah, we have common shared values. Those things unite us. I believe passionately in our ability to come together, and I believe that working together, we can solve Utah's problems. I'm Devin Thorpe. I'm a Democrat. I'm running to represent the people of Utah's third district. I'm Devin Thorpe, a candidate for Congress, and I approved this message.